Um, well, I don't know. Um, I haven't heard from him either, but uh, my sense is that I can jump in and do what I can do. Hey, why don't we go ahead and call the work session to order then? The running. All right. Good evening. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get started here tonight. We have Brendan Buckley with Johnson Economics, who will be uh, beginning to go over the work session materials. OK, thank you. So I'm going to get started. Um, as we just noted, uh, my partner in crime is not here yet. I have not received a message from him. So. Um, just so you know, as we get started, that I have worked on some of this material and um, MIG has worked on a majority of the material, uh, but I'm very familiar with all these concepts and ideas, so I'll just have to do the best that I can um, and we'll, we'll kind of get started and work our way through it. Um, and uh, there may be some questions I know how to answer better than others or, um, or uh, Lori can help us out. So um, the agenda for this work session, um, we did a similar meeting with the uh, advisory committee a couple weeks ago. We have um, a similar agenda tonight, but less time. So we're going to kind of try to move through quite a bit of material um, and just hit the high points. Um, but of course, we can answer questions and uh, take comments as, as you have them. Um, so the agenda is to talk, uh, give a real quick update, first of all, about the population forecast we're using for this analysis, and then get into measures um, to accommodate uh, needed housing, which is a document, a draft document that is in your packet, and I think you probably received earlier. Ah, here he is. Um, so we will um, get into that and ta start talking about some of these draft ideas and strategies from that. Um, in terms of the process, we have been moving through this housing needs analysis process. Uh, we have um, are here in the last stage. Uh, however, it's a, it's a phase that will take a little while. We're going to go through some iterations and some drafts mm -hmm. on these strategies before we arrive at a uh, final set of recommendations and uh, based on based on your comment and what the what the community is telling us. Um, so uh, CJ can talk a little bit more about the final schedule when we get to next steps. Uh, so I will give a real quick update about the PSU population forecast. So um, in the uh, the prior material we provided you, which included a forecast of housing needed over 20 years, um, we used a population forecast from Portland State as that's required by statute. Well, what's happened in the meantime is that the 2020 census came out with new population estimates that are different. Uh, you know, PSU very naturally, their estimates are going to get off um, between the major censuses. So a new one comes out and they have to correct it. So we've been working with them to um, try to get that done and have that signed off on uh, by DLCD so that we'll be able to use that uh, sort of more accurate numbers that will um, uh, the the census was uh, higher than their estimate by about 650 people. So if we do a revised forecast based on that, uh, it's going uh, to amount to about uh, 215 more households need or housing units needed over the 20 year period, about 20 percent more than we are forecasting currently. So um, again, that's all underway and we need to just make sure that we get that kind of um, signed off on by DLCD and buttoned up so that uh, um, doesn't come back to bite us later in an appeal or something like that. So that's just a quick update on the forecast, and then we're going to move into the next step, which is talking about measures to accommodate housing, and then we'll turn it over to CJ. Okay. A little head nod for slides, if that's all right. Um, hello, my name is CJ Doxy. I'm with MIG. I'm part of the consultant team, and I'm going to walk you through uh, pretty pretty briefly or pretty quickly through the uh, most of the elements or all the elements in the 
uh, housing strategies report, the measures to accommodate needed housing. So there are uh, four sections to it. Sections two, three, and four are really the meat and potatoes. Section one is really just kind of descriptive of it. Um, and sections two and three present a, kind of an implementation uh, approach for the city in terms of implementing the uh, housing needs analysis there. And so what that includes are recommended comprehensive plan amendments. And within that, there are the housing conditions and trends, which is really the findings, all the information in terms of what your existing conditions are, what your future forecasted conditions are, and documenting that as your uh, factual basis for making informed uh, land use decisions moving forward. And then section three is your comprehensive plan housing policies. Um, and that includes a fairly high level review slash audit of your existing comprehensive plan policies against uh, various housing factors or criteria that we look at when we look at a fairly complete set of comprehensive housing policies. So um, we'll go over that in a little more detail. And then if you could skip ahead for me. So within the housing conditions and trend, um, again, that did just it documents all the work that we've been doing over the course of this project since it, it started out. What we're recommending is a full replacement of the findings in your comprehensive plan from your previous h &A, which was done in 2017-2018. Um, so this is just updated information across the board for that. And um, the way it's written in Section 2 is you can just pick that up and put it into your comprehensive plan. Now. Um, to kind of circle back to Brandon's point there, it does include the forecast information, which is currently in the process of um, being updated to reflect census information. So um, one thing to note is uh, until that changes or until we get the LCD's approval, it we'll, won't update that yet. But um, at some point that'll happen and we'll make sure that's incorporated here and the city has that information to work with. Um, Next slide, please. Skip it. That's kind of an animated part. This one. So as far as your comprehensive plan housing policies, this is section three. Um, we're recommending seven new policies, and section three includes um, the proposed policy language in legislative format, so it has an underlying strikeout. Um, I will say that uh, for a number of these recommended policies, the city is already doing lot of this work already. We're just kind of circling back or backing into the policy standpoint. To give you an example. The easiest one is allowing ADUs, right? City already allows and permits ADUs to do, um, to do a really good job in terms of allowing that, but there wasn't a policy basis for that. So we're just recommending that that becomes a policy statement so that you're having a more comprehensive picture. Um, so to kind of run. CJ, yes. um, out of all of the uh, on section three comprehensive plan housing policies, out of all of these bullets identified, how many do we already have in play? I think um, it's probably easier to say which one you don't have already in play, and that is um, evaluating the need to regulate short term rentals. So for all the others um, to City is already doing it to a certain extent, um, some more obvious than others, but um, some of them of the policy languages uh, a little high level. So uh, making exciting ex examples of that is not as easy to articulate. Um, I will refer to essentially saying support the Fair Housing Act, which is uh, federal policy uh, around ensuring that uh, housing is produced and in an equitable manner um, and make sure that uh, federally protected classes aren't being discriminated discriminated against in terms of your, your housing policies, that sort of thing. So um, just that's a fairly high level one. We're recommending that be included. But uh, again, it's something that, you know, cities to a large extent already do. The one that isn't in there is the evaluating the need to regulate short term rentals. And we're not saying you need to. But um, you know, it is a growing area for a lot of cities. Um, certainly, more uh, 
more of a pressing concern in some areas than than others. And we don't know if there's a big need for that in Skepus. There might be, but so far we haven't heard um, a need for that. But we want to make sure that um, if there there's an opportunity to evaluate that and give city planning department the, the policy direction to do so if the need arises. Could you give us an example of what a short term rental would look like? Yeah, Air, Airbnbs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I will say that the city already regulates B and B's, um, but they don't. The city doesn't have a, a way of regulating Airbnbs, VRBOs, or other similar type of uh, short term accommodations. And so maybe a policy example would be what maybe I think it was Lincoln City or some of the coastal communities have been deciding to do around Airbnbs and regulating. Uh, the duration of time that somebody could actually use the like stay occupied in those dwellings. Is that a, a fairly good example? Yeah, I think so. I think um, the one that comes to mind um, is another project that we're working with right now um, is North Bend, and they've already implemented a number of regulations around short term rentals. Um, and they seem to be a little bit more on um, the they basically cap the number of short term rentals that you can. I believe they regulate it through commercial permits. So if you're going to do it, you need to get a commercial permit and it, Got it. that sort of thing. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So any questions on the policies? And we're going to, uh, we'll move on to some of the more substantial things. So yes, thank you. Before we go on real quick, there was a question I had in regards to the population update by PSU. Will that be presented to council before it's submitted to the state so that we understand what the the variable change was that was uh, brought back from the census numbers? Good question. So in terms of our role in this project, we have one opportunity this work session to come before you and have this discussion. Um, we won't have another opportunity as consultants to come back here, but um, for the housing needs analysis uh, to become official, it will need to go through planning commission and city council, um, typical public hearings, at which point you will see uh, Lori's staff report and she will um, indicate, you know, what sort of changes were made to that. Um, also, the the template or the agreement is something DLCD will sign off on before any cities can use or implement this alternative method. Thank you. Is it possible we won't get approval? Approval of adjusted forecast? Uh -huh. um, yeah. And if we don't get it, then what does that mean to us? Um, so the difference is what, what I stated there with just the, the difference in people and, and the amount of um, housing forecasted. And, you know, it's always great to use the more accurate number. So we really hope to use it. It's a weird situation where everyone involved understands the common sense of using it, but the actual statute was written in a way that makes it difficult. And of course, nobody wants to break the law while doing this. So PSU and the state are trying to figure out how to how to make it work. All right, so these next two slides are a fairly high um, overview of a lot of the content that we're going to be running through uh, in a short amount of time. Um, but please feel free to ask questions at any point to go through this. These are housing strategies that um, we've identified that uh, the city can use to promote housing in a variety of different ways. Some of these are easier for the city to do mainly your policy and code recommendations. Some of these are a little bit um, more, uh, would require a little bit more resources in order to be able to accomplish. And um, while still valid and applicable, require a little bit of planning in order to get them up off the ground. So what we've done for each of these strategies is assign kind of a near-term, long-term uh, category to it. Um, there's, each one of these isn't exactly prescriptive. Um, it's really just as a kind of a, a prioritization in terms of what our initial assessment of you know, what makes the most sense for the city to do now. Then 
um, what makes the most sense for the city to keep in their toolbox if the need should arise. So we've kind of categorized these uh, according to that, and um, we'll go through this particular bunch um, probably in a little bit more detail than the second one, which um, includes, if you want to go to the next slide, um, or incentives or programmatic strategies, which for the most part are all long term. Can you just describe um, when you say long term versus near term, what yes. kind of time frames you're thinking? Yeah, so the the near term, we're thinking something for the city to um, look into and implement sometime within the next five years. Um, long term is within the planning horizon, so 20 years. And the, the long term is um, I say 20 years, but it's really as as the need arises. Um, you know, when we're forecasting and looking 20 years into the future, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. Um, and so we want to make sure that if things do change, if the situation um, does uh, change in a way that we haven't anticipated, that the city has the resource or the the, the knowledge and and a good uh, starting point to change course or. Uh, accommodate those changes. So uh, an example of that, although, um, is the, the the forecast, right? So there's more recent relevant data that shows that the city is growing faster than what it was initially forecast. We've done everything we can to kind of accommodate that as much as possible within, you know, what we're statutorily uh, um, allowed to do. Um, but yeah, we recognize that uh, the city is growing and it's growing faster than what I think a lot of people expected. So we want to make sure that if that trend continues, you have uh, have strategies to, to meet that need. So it's short term in there somewhere. Is that it? Uh, short term is uh, me not catching a uh, find and replace in the document. They were all originally called short term, but we decided near term would be a little more descriptive. So anonymous. Right. Quick question. So in, in my understanding with the UGB under the land use strategies, right? Expansion or adjustment. Yes. Um, adjustment is probably first step in looking what is actually available is uh, for that growth space and providing housing, right? But it doesn't also density, if we had density as a priority or a, an immediate change in, in the policies, I guess, or the permitting, but that also impact what we can do within our current ur urban growth boundary without potentially having to expand. Uh, yes. Um, I, so a lot of what you can do from an efficiency standpoint, making sure you're using the and that you have available the most efficient way possible um, does diminish the need for a UGB expansion. So there's tension there. There's a bit of a trade off or a push and pull in some respects. Um, in order for a UGB expansion to be approved by DLCD, they um, say that you need to implement some efficiency measures prior to doing that. Um, but uh, the way the UGB expansions work typically is you have uh, need to identify a need for it. So if your forecasted population exceeds what you're capable of from a theoretical standpoint, um, you do your implement your efficiency measures, but then you can also do your UGB. Almost as a secondary, if need be, if, if the density doesn't meet the demand for the housing stock that we would project for. Right. Good. Thank you. So um, the land supply strategies, this is a, a very big one. Um, the, there's kind of two elements to it. One is expanding. Um, or adjusting the urban growth boundary. The expansion is straightforward. You're just looking to expand your GB, UGB. Um, currently, with the, the way we have forecasted uh, and inventory land, we don't find a need. But we do recognize that the city is on the margin, um, and that may adjust to varying degrees depending on how DLCD updates their numbers. So. Um, for now, we're not finding that need, but we're still in a kind of a wait and see mode, see what that looks like. Um, the other aspect of it is an adjustment where you are equally adding and removing land to the UGB. You're essentially swapping it out. Um, and this is a useful tool and one that's come up 
a bit over the course of this project to um, remove parts of the UGB that you're not anticipated to develop and basically swapping them out for areas that you do anticipate to develop. So you're uh, increasing the efficiency of, of the land that you have. Uh, the second land supply strategy, which is probably uh, more applicable out of the two, at least within uh, Scapoose's uh, context, is to rezone the land. We found there is a shortage of medium and, and higher density residential zones within the city. Um, so we're recommending that uh, in, the, in the near term, the city take a look at rezoning some of the land that they currently have. You could either do um, upzoning from like a lower residential density to a medium or medium to higher, or you could look at converting commercial land into residential land. Um, the nice thing about uh, this, along with your economic opportunity analysis, which is getting off the ground, that's a separate but parallel project where they'll be looking at your commercial and industrial land. They'll be able to say whether or not you have enough uh, land in a similar capacity as what we're doing with the residential. Um, and so if in that scenario they say you have sufficient supply of land, then rezoning from commercial to residential may be a good choice. Otherwise, um, as, a, as a policy decision, that'll be something that uh, both these bodies will need to consider as part of the recommendation there. I have a question. Since we're talking about both the residential and commercial, my biggest concern is that because we have a shortage of mid to higher density zoned land, what's happening is that commercial land, which allows higher density, to be purchased up and built up into just apartments, where what we really need, we still need a supply of commercial land. Right. And my question is, is that does it make sense when we're looking at those? The commercial and expanded commercial zones to require those zones commercial on the first floor and residential on top in all those zones and then also look at some swap areas where maybe that shouldn't be commercial it should be higher residential but that would that would take give the city more in those commercial zones better downtown look than all of a sudden you just have more apartments more apartments Apartments, which is what has happened here in town on commercial properties at least two times. Mm -hmm. It would be really nice to be able to say that no, you can build some housing on top, but we need that front level commercial in the commercial zone. Yeah. Yeah, your the way your code is currently written, it allows just strictly multifamily residential or mixed use. Um, there are other jurisdictions who um, don't who allow um, mixed use, but not residential only, and that, that could be- uh, well, That's kind of what I'm saying. That's um, kind of what I feel like I would like to see. Right. Can we get it done by December 31st? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think too, just to, to speak to that, um, Mayor, is that it, it's looking like preliminarily that there is gonna be a deficit for commercial land anyway, as part of the EOA that they're doing. So I think, this is just one component to the larger plan and the conversation or the ideas that you're just presenting are absolutely going to be on the table for consideration mm -hmm. to decide, you know, either we can rezone some existing, say, R4 land to an A1 so it's strictly apartments and we know kind of where they're going to be and they're near lots of amenities and services um, we could require the mixed use um, in those areas. But either way, I mean, we... That's absolutely within our control to to look at and decide how that works best. And that's that's really you know for me, yeah. uh, what I'd really like to see because, you know, when you have a commercial center, whether it's box like stores and restaurants or downtown center, I think you want to maintain that commercial viability. And I get that apartments are a commercial activity; mm -hmm. but they're a residential activity, and the city needs to be able to say. No, this is our downtown. We want to protect it. And whoever uh, is sitting here in January, I'll be commenting to that all the way through this plan. Yeah, indeed. Sorry, I do have another concern too. Is is uh, when you're trying to uh, 
to justify for the density of residential that you don't they don't go high. So yeah, our our code already allows for quite a bit of height. Yeah. I don't think that that's anything we would consider. That would certainly not not be my recommendation. Right. And 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 you'll hear I think probably CJ mention as we go along and and maybe you're not aware. Well, no, you've already heard it too, but in 2018 we made a ton of changes to all chapters of the residential development code to increase density. So I don't know that there's an appetite to continue to densify to any large extent um, our residential zoning districts currently, because I feel like we already did that. Now there's some fine tuning for sure. There's some opportunities to fine tune a few things, but whole scale changing all minimum lot sizes like we did a few years ago. I, I don't know that that's what Scapoose is about. Because yeah, you said is it 47, how much is the limit? Uh, 60 feet in the uh, expanded commercial. Yeah, for multifamily. Yeah. So you're saying that it, it's what's done is done? Currently. Currently. And is there any chance that we can reduce that in the future? That would be difficult to do. Yeah. So um, going back to Scott's real quick, I was going to ask now in order to have it so that it was required for mixed use, is that a policy or is a code change or is that yeah. a rezone? It's a code change. Build on that. Go ahead. And so Lori, like if we've been talking about the downtown overlay, mm -hmm. I think about as the mayor is indicating that we would have a vibrant downtown community uh, core. Sure. So if we were to say move, moving forward, incorporate mixed use with commercial residential in this specific block zone, that we would be able to make those changes moving forward to have um, a vision of what that area would look like. Yeah, and that was actually considered during the last um, changes that we made to the development code, but ultimately decided against it just because of the cost to construct uh, that type of building and that that really there's always this weighing between affordability and cost to develop versus, you know, the end product that, that the council and the, and the community wants. And so, uh, you know, how we address that was to sort of incentivize um, mixed use development. So in the downtown overlay properties, um, instead of having a 35 foot height limit, uh, if you develop with mixed use, then you could go up to 45 feet, right? So that's like a give for the city. Like, we want you to do this, so we'll give you an extra 10 feet so that you can make it work. Um, and, and the reason it's capped at 35 and 45 is to just make it more pedestrian friendly in those areas. I, you know, I think that my only point, and I think I made the point in 2018, 2017 yep. as well, is that me, especially since the Sounds like it's going to show a shortage of commercial properties. We should be primarily trying to protect commercial properties for commercial uses that are not not just residential but mixed use mm -hmm. or regular commercial, and not really change the the codes in those areas even faster than near term as possible. That says, yeah, no, we really don't want, and the, I don't think the community really wants to have a disjointed downtown. I think they would really rather have something mm -hmm. where. It more looks like a community center. Yeah, indeed. So. And and as part of this, um, and what you know, we have the uh, consultant team scope to do is to make those changes as part of this process and to adopt those whole scale zone changes and development code revisions as part of this process. So in in two years, essentially from now, when we go to adoption. In the meantime. We'll we could be losing any uh, commercial space that we have to more apartments until it's adopted? That's correct. Anything that's on the books now absolutely applies. So we don't, um, you know, making the change now, just a part of it, it doesn't, in other words, we need to see the whole picture of what's, what's happening in the city. Um, the EOA is not complete yet. Um, that would need to be done first. We need to see the other land needs, parks, uh, public uh, uses. Um, so we want to have a look at all of that before we start making changes to to the zoning specifically. Um, but trying to do it all at once 
is has to do with staffing levels at the city as well and having a consultant on board to to do the heavy lift means that we can get a lot more done um, at once as opposed to trying to wrap this project up and then start on to that or do it midway. Move on to the next slide, but if any other questions pop up, we can go back to it. So policy and development code strategies, these um, I've already to a certain extent talked about, uh, touched on a number of these here. Um, for all of these, these are short term strategies, what we're recommending here, except for the um, increase, the, increasing the allowed densities there, which is something that uh, the city had a good amount of focus and attention to as part of the previous HNA. But everything else here, to a large extent, is a refinement of what the city is already doing or has already implemented as part of the previous HNA. Um, probably the biggest example of that is um, allowing a variety of housing types. So, as part of the previous HNA, um, the city went and uh, allowed duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, townhouses, that sort of thing. So our recommendation is to continue that um, and, and look at refining it to be able to support those housing types um, further than, than what the city is already doing. Um, and that's because, uh, you know, there's there's a need for that kind of middle housing type in in, in the city there. It's, it's a good balance between low density residential while also making sure you're using the your available land most efficiently. Um, similar thing with your promoting your accessory dwelling units. Again, the city is already doing this. Um, our recommendations are looking at refining that a little bit further. So um, one of those things or a couple of those things that could be considered as part of that is right now you're allowing one ADU. It could uh, potentially be expanded to allowing two ADUs, um, one attached to the primary structure, so a basement or an attic or um, an attached garage, but also allowing an ADU in the backyard. And that still keeps it with the neighborhood character, but increasing number of units that uh, can be used for and available for people who need smaller housing. Um, other recommendations related to your um, accessory dwelling units are having special allowances for setback requirements so that um, it does open up a site, uh, a little, make it a little bit easier for you to put an ADU in your backyard. You wouldn't have to um, necessarily meet the setback requirements if it's under a certain height. Um, and then the other one, I'm sure this is going to be a big hit, is reducing the parking requirements for ADUs. Um, so having uh, the way the code is currently written is you need a parking space for an ADU unless you already have three on site. So these are all things to consider as far as promoting ADUs. Um, and leave it there if there are any questions on that. Yes. But that would repeat it itself in your report over and over again about parking. Yes. Uh, uh, the purpose of that is to provide more low income housing. Is that what? Um, in a very indirect way, um, I wouldn't say it's it's low income or affordable housing, but when you are requiring parking, that is an additional cost. Um, and the the kind of the mentality or the thinking behind reducing those requirements is to leave the decision on how many parking spaces to supply in the hands more in the hands of the developer who is res responding to the market. He doesn't have to live with it. Correct. Yes. <laughs> so it's our responsibility, not him. Yes. So there, there, there are trade offs. I recognize that. And, you know, I also acknowledge that, you know, Scapoose, Skip, um, you know, transit is, is pretty minimal here. So there are a number of trade offs that need it's to be minimal. considered. Minimal. I think you got a bus that goes downtown. Transit. 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 Excuse Excuse me. Me. Yeah. It's pretty minimal. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's getting I, less. They're taking not out. Right. I would actually echo your concern in regards to parking because we do know that nearly 80% of our residents are employed outside of the community, mm -hmm. right? And so we know that single vehicle occupancy is at a high rate. We also know that our local transportation option through uh, Columbia Rider diminishing, yes. cutting back services. 
We are looking at our partners with PCC is potentially opening up a, another bus line from campus, Rock Creek campus to Omic, which could alleviate some of those pinch points because then it connects into the TriMet system at Rock Creek. But I think that that is something that we just need to acknowledge as we think about, you know, we want to grow local jobs and have that. And so I think when we get to a certain point, when we know that the jobs are here for our individuals, right, right now that 80% is such a high number of folks that are leaving. I think that we just need to keep that in our, in our mind as we move forward. I think those are all very valid comments. Um, and again, these are, these are trade-offs that we hopefully are giving you enough information to make an informed decision off of. Additionally, from the uh, city infrastructure standpoint, it's not like our street situation is really good for on street parking or off residents. So I, I, as a citizen, would be looking at that, like what are we trying to do in terms of our street pass throughs and so on. So beyond just the baseline. Um, I knew that was going to be a hit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just the messenger, right? Thanks. Yeah, right? No, thanks. Um, Thanks for the idea. <laughs> Great idea. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> um, so moving on, uh, the, the strategy number five there is regulatory incentives for affordable or workforce housing. And what this strategy is, is um, having certain allowances within your development code for developments that include a certain threshold of affordable housing units in it and what that looks like in terms of number of units or how affordable they are is something that can be determined as you're going through that strategy. But uh, incentives for that include um, increasing the allowed height if you're including an affordable element to it or reducing parking or um, increasing density or, or other setbacks that say if, if you give if you provide affordable housing here, we will give you a benefit to incentivize it or offset your costs in a way to make it potentially pencil out. Is Wilsonville an example that we would think of for workforce housing? So the Fred Myers, when they developed the Fred Meyer off I-5. They also put a, an apartment complex on their property that allowed for staff to have this affordable housing is that the idea when you talk about workforce housing, or is there a better kind of example that for us to wrap our heads around? I'm not familiar with the, work, sure. the Wilsonville example. I suppose, I mean, that does sound like it could fit the bill. Um, to give you an example of what that would look like, um, trying to think. So I'm, I'm going to I'm going to kind of default to the easy one, which is Portland. Um, and Portland basically says if you provide uh, affordable housing on it, uh, at least from a, a smaller scale, like the residential infill project, um, they basically say if you add two, if you add affordable housing units, um, you can do an additional two units on a typical family lot. Mm -hmm. So. Um, that just got implemented. We'll see how the, the, the market responds to that, but that's a, a pretty straightforward example off the top of my head. Do you have any? Um, so there are examples of what you're talking about. Um, the coast, uh, small communities on the coast have started to talk about this quite a bit because many of them have a some sort of major employer in town, like a hospital, and they're um, just kind of screaming that their workers can't find any place to live nearby. Um, so it, it ha the problem has to be pretty acute for a, for one specific employer to build workforce housing, but sometimes that term is used really to describe a different part of the affordability spectrum. So these um, terms can be a little squishy, but sometimes uh, when people talk about affordable housing, they might be talking about like sort of deeply, you know, sort of subsidized housing really for the the poorest and most uh, uh, lowest income renters. And then workforce housing is sometimes used to describe folks who might be making 60% of median income, 80%, and they're the, they're employed, um, but still with the with housing the way it is across the state, you know, there's an affordability crunch. And um, so uh, just that different part of the income spectrum, essentially. Perfect. That's, yeah, thank you. I just want to confirm that 
low or affordable housing doesn't equal low quality housing, right? Absolutely, so you're yeah. Not trying to squeeze as many people into a space that normally it's not set up for that amount of people. Right. Right. Okay. Yes. And it also would include um, vouchers, um, vouchers for folks who can live around the community. Yeah. Cool. I know that the coastal communities, having just spent some time in Newport with other mayors, that especially like Newport, some part of their short term rental policies to address housing shortages in those communities. And, you know, people at Pacific Seafood literally for the summers rents out yes. the Shiloh Inn for their temporary workforce because they don't have housing in Newport to house them. They rent out an entire hotel for mm -hmm. the entire summer. That they bring in so. Yeah, that's the kind. Of I know that I know that that the, the temporary or short-term rental housing on the coast is one of those policy drivers. Is very much housing shortages and the cost of housing. The people that work get into those housing. That's right. Yeah. Um, they because of their peculiar nature of being stuck on the coast with mountain range behind them. They sometimes feel these problems really acutely so I use them as examples a lot but um, you know they apply here too maybe just not quite as acute do we have an employer in town that this would be oh. um, the only well, the nurseries employ temporary summer help and I think most of those workers probably from you see the end of shift are going back over the hill to Hillsboro or, or Portland. But, I mean, if there was housing adequate for them, they might stay here. No. The development on Sycamore Street was built yeah, with that yes. purpose in mind. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. There's no, is it still a seasonal housing? I don't think it's seasonal, but it's I not think. seasonal, but it's still under the same farm workers. Yeah. Farm workers. Farm workers. Yeah, because it was uh, funded by ASA. Federal. Yeah. Like federal under the. Dollars. Agricultural department. But it, so it no longer is. It, it, it's no longer for seasonal workers. And none of the employees from a major nursery in town here live there. And most people that work at that major nursery do live over the hill on the other side. That makes sense. Okay. But there isn't too much seasonal work at that major nursery. So moving on to the next strategy, which is reducing regulatory barriers to housing. This one. Or before you jump into that one, uh, what about um, PCC and developing the housing for students? Would that be an example of employer to housing? I'm Dormitories are an interesting situation. They're a little unique. Um, and I didn't really look at it from a dormitory perspective. Young. I know I saw something about young um, residents, and so maybe that could be a transition from college to you know, adulthood. Right. Option. Yeah. Um, so the next strategy has a few elements to it. This is kind of a, a more kind of a catch all category. Um, and for reducing unnecessary barriers to housing, this has uh, the recommendations will have more to do from like a, a, an administrative procedural perspective, um, particularly with your review procedures. And I think this is a pretty substantial one for the city. Currently, if you were to develop a triplex, quadplex townhouse, um, those sort of developments have to go through a public hearing process and be reviewed by the Planning Commission. Whereas something like a single family or duplex are reviewed administratively through staff and approved with director's approval there. So our recommendation is to have the middle housing types that are currently going through planning commission review be reviewed by planning staff instead. And that um, does enable uh, for those types of development to be more likely to be developed just because planning commission and public hearing process does Add some uncertainty and cost and time while the developments are having to carry any loans while they go through the public hearing process. Um, 
and part of the part of the reasoning behind that is for those particular housing types, they are subject to clear and objective standards in your development code. Um, so you're still ensuring that those housing types are a good fit from a neighborhood character standpoint. They're being limited by their bulk height and size and location with your setback requirements, your height requirements, and your minimum lot size requirements to make sure that they are, uh, in large respect, you know, pretty similar to single family housing. So um, another aspect of this is uh, reducing regulatory barriers to housing would be a recommendation to increase your lot coverage standards. Currently, your lot coverage hovers in the 35 to 40 percent, so meaning that can't develop more than 35 or 40 percent of your lot. Um, our recommendation is to increase that by 10 percent, depending on the zone, uh, and that would give uh, housing development a little bit more flexibility in terms of developing on a new site or redeveloping on an existing site, and also kind of ties back into the recommendation for ADUs, where it allows much more flexibility in terms of siting that ADU on the site. Um, also, again, minimum parking requirements, um, reduction for there. I will say, though, um, and this is something that is probably more long term, even though the strategy is short term, but just recognizing that within the tw next 20 years, the city is going to uh, is expected to grow over 10,000 people in population. Once you have exceeded 10,000 population of 10,000, there are state requirements for middle housing that will kick in, at which point the city will need to update their code to um, reduce the parking requirements and um, change the code or your development code regulations so that duplexes are on the same footing from every development code perspective as single family residential. So recommendation is really just to look forward to that, acknowledging that it, it will be coming. I understand. Not everybody's favorite, but um, a recommendation is anticipation of that. I have a question. Yes. Would it be a reduction of parking from the standards where it, it, it is, or is there already a percentage that it's reduced? So it's like if we reduce our parking restrictions, does it take it from there and then reduce it more? Or your, is a reduction? It's a reduction from your, what you're currently allowing? You're currently at yeah. So currently, your code standards require two spaces per unit. So if you were to develop a duplex, that would require four spaces. Um, the way the middle housing state rules um, are written is a single family or a duplex, you wouldn't be able to require more than two spots, regardless of housing. Where do the other cars go? On the street. Yeah. The street. Now that's that's, well, that's that street's already one of the spots. So right. So and, and this is this is where some of the Donald Shoop logic comes into play, where the expectation is um, the market will respond accordingly. So if you're requiring two minimum parking spaces, but everyone needs a parking space, and a developer says, "Well, well I will provide four because that's going to make my house more marketable than that has two. and it, leaving it in their hands, understandably mm -hmm. that still is a cause for concern for several people. I have a question in that case. So does the city start regulating how many vehicles a household should have? You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah. I mean, the, I'm, that'd be fair. Like my neighbor has 10 cars mm -hmm. and I don't I have two. Then they're taking all over the whole street. So it's like, I, I don't know. So. Right. Yeah. The regulating the number of cars that people can have is is a little trickier. I haven't seen it done. Um, but uh, right, there's always creative solutions. Just ask all the neighbors in Portland to vote. Yeah. <laughs> Complexes without parking. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Please. Just I wanted to take a quick step back. Uh, it indicated that the planning commission could potentially not review those specific varieties of uh, dwellings. If they didn't, what responsibility would they hold as a commission? They would still review multifamily developments and um, certain types of con all conditional uses, right? Yeah, or, all conditional uses, um, uh, whatever other housing types weren't, weren't excluded, like multifamily, and then um, 
you know, any quasi-judicial decision, any sensitive lands, variances, uh, zone changes, um, text comp plan amendments. Um, Plenty of work to still be reviewing. Correct. Perfect. Thank you. And actually, a question on that, because it was specifically listed cottage clusters as a style mm -hmm. uh, for the pass-through. That one gives me pause, given that it substantial land coverage and infrastructure for something to be just passed through without guidance. Like I, I, I'm, I understand duplexes or even mm -hmm. some townhome structures, but some of these seem pretty substantial change outs. I would tend to agree with the cottage housing just going through. Um, certainly though, duplexes, triplexes, quadplex, you know, even maybe up to, an eight unit. I don't know what where this is the conversation we'll have that when we get to the code changes so that everyone's involved and can vet all of the changes. That makes sense. Yeah. I think anytime you're looking at like a oh, I want to do something different with what would be a normal plot. That makes sense. Right. We're and doing then, like five plots, maybe we should be more involved. The cottage cluster really is great for kind of infill projects too, where you have really odd shaped parcel and you're trying to fit stuff on there and it doesn't lay out the way a normal site would lay out and, and it gives some more creativity um, to that process. All good questions, good discussions. I like it. Um, minutes. Okay, so I think we're in the home stretch here. We do have a number of strategies to go through. Um, so fortunately for the rest of these, they are fairly um, more straightforward. I will say, at least for the increased allowed densities, acknowledging that the city went through this particular effort um, previously, and to Lori's point, that might not be much of an appetite for it. Um, recognizing that, we do have uh, a couple recommendations to um, refine that a little bit further from a infill perspective. So currently, minimum lot size requirements are written like the duplex. You have X number of feet, and then if you do units three and four, you have a certain increment that goes up with it, right? Um, a recommendation is to reduce the lot size for those increments to make it a little bit more viable for the middle housing type. That, um, I think we can move it on to the next set of things and I'll go over to Brent. Thank you. Um, thanks. So uh, we are, uh, we uh, we have about 10 minutes left in our allotted time, and um, that's okay because our, the idea was to move through these a little faster. These were all sort of longer term ideas. They fall in the category of either sort of incentives that the city could consider offering in order to encourage um, specific types of uh, development they'd like to see or you'd like to see. Um, and then the other set of strategies has to do with funding sources and the kind of programs that actually get housing built. So I'm going to move through these kind of kind of as a checklist and um, but we of course can can talk about them uh, in more detail if you like. Um, so in terms of incentives, um, you know, cities itself is not involved in, in building housing. So how do what does it mean to uh, for the city to kind of get involved and try to incentivize these things? CJ's talked a lot about what you can do with the code to try to facilitate uh, certain types of development. Um, these are things that might offer a little more enticement to developers and the definition of what the city would define as sort of housing that you'd like to incentivize is up to you. So often that means affordable housing. If the community feels like there is an affordable housing crunch, um, that is one thing that the, the housing needs analysis finds, um, which is common across all communities. Um, so uh, affordable housing um, is is one category, but also the city might want to encourage, uh, you know, mixed use housing in certain areas. They might want to encourage multifamily housing in, in certain areas, maybe not in others. So you can think of it both geographically and in terms of housing. Um, generally, obviously, you want to con uh, concentrate on the types of housing that you don't think are happening or being delivered by the uh, the market uh, in a natural fashion. So the first one is uh, system development charge uh, waivers or deferrals. The um, 
this is a, a way to incentivize and offer a, a little bit of a, a break to developers in the initial uh, stages of development. Um, you can either uh, completely waive those types of charges or look at deferrals uh, until the project is finished and kind of becomes, uh, you know, get some cash flow and then uh, they can pay their SDCs. That, that can be quite a help to developers. And also uh, another option is financing uh, through the city, which can offer a way to finance and pay for those over time, usually at a, at a great uh, interest rate. So that's another uh, enticement. Tax exemptions or abatements. There are a number of programs that the state authorizes, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to offer uh, abatements for different types of property. Some of those are aimed at affordable housing in terms of subsidized affordable housing, but there are others that are aimed at, uh, you know, achieving vertical housing or even just achieving um, multifamily housing in, in general. So there are a few programs there. Generally, cities choose to uh, do tax abatements for 10 years or something along those lines. Afterwards, uh, that you'd get that tax revenue back. Or I'm sorry, you don't you don't get the tax revenue from that 10 years, but you would start collecting tax revenue going forward. So I understand that that would would not have to necessarily apply to the fire department and other uh, taxing entities. They they could still uh, they they get shortchanged in a lot of this stuff. Uh, and so if we were to abate taxes for property. Uh, that doesn't mean. The others have to do it too, right? Yeah, it, it actually does. Well, there are some options. So we looked at this a few years back to see if any of the tax abatements were something the city was interested in. Um, and you're right, Jeff Pritchard did come to speak on that because they are getting hit with the Urban Renewal District and other things. And um, there was an opposition to that, not to us being able to incentivize, but the fact that he needs money, obviously, to survive as well. And so there was talk about, well, did, did just the city want to abate just the city taxes? And that was just a drop in the bucket and wouldn't really make an appreciable difference. And so the route that council did choose to go is to go with the low income, um, the low income, basically, well, it's the low income rental housing tax abatement. And so it was for nonprofit housing providers um, that we would abate their taxes. And the city passed it, um, but the school district did not. And we needed that 51% of the tax base in order to make it effective across all taxing districts. And we did not have the support. So it's not in effect. At the time, that was the only one that was really something that the council had an appetite for. So we will revisit this, but these are just, again, laying out all the options and things that cities look at and consider. And again, they might not all fit here, but at least it's presented as an option. This report made it sound like it was, it wouldn't have to be anticipated if they didn't want to. I read it. That makes more sense. Uh, land use Permit fee is similar idea to the system development charges. Generally, the permit um, fee is less than than SDCs, so it's you know kind of uh, a lesser incentive in most cases. But it, it's the same idea. And then expedited development review. So for developers, um, you know, time is money. So if there's any uh, way that you could um, expedite review and approvals for the desired types of development, uh, that's a good incentive. We talked about this with the with Lori and with the city and you guys already uh, seem to be doing a pretty efficient job. So there's only only so much you can, um, so many more efficiencies you can squeeze out, but that's just something to keep in mind. Getting into funding sources, are we? Here did, um... Was the mayor was the sense that you might want to continue this into the body of the meeting, or is this something you would want to um, look at on on your own um, and and not continue? Just wanted to be respectful of the time. Council, yeah, I'm good with our own. Yeah, I, I agree. It's pretty. Start watching videos on. I was like, I had there's so much watching portions of watching your correct. 
something that if they have questions or that was awkward and painful and just I have another question. We probably lost me. I have is we mute people on for sure. Well, anything the ribs internally. Thank you. One of the concerns I have with affordable housing is that a lot of the affordable housing is not built purchased by low income people. It's purchased by people who want rentals. And uh, uh, is there a way to uh, make sure that the people who need to have this kind of uh, that was off. Uh, is there is there a way that we can ensure that people who are low income can actually purchase these homes and not allow them to be purchased by so many people who just want more rentals? Yeah, so most um, most subsidized housing um, traditionally has been rental housing. It's more straightforward to regulate it and make sure that you're renting to um, lower income people over time. There are there's one major new idea for trying to spread that to um, home ownership. And that generally it's what's called a community land trust. It's on this list and you'll find more information in your packet. But it, the idea is that uh, the, a nonprofit agency basically owns and maintains the land and the units on it, uh, usually multifamily or kind of condoized, sold um, at an affordable rate to first time home buyers. And then there's an agreement that they in fact need to um, sell to another qualified buyer when they move out or do some type of profit sharing and so or so on. So there's agreements in place to try to keep it affordable over time. Um, there are examples of this that are starting to happen, but it's it's much uh, it's still kind of new, frankly, in most communities. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, housing okay, authorities do that. Seven o'clock now. So why don't we go ahead and adjourn the work session? Thank you, everyone, Thank for you. turning out. Uh, why don't we take a couple of minutes to reset the room and need to use the restroom real quick or whatnot. That's okay. Thank you very much.